Sorry. My name is uh, Fred Litwin, and I manage the, uh, the Free Thinking Film Society. Some of the history of the Free Thinking Film Society. I started this a couple of years ago. I was largely driven by Michael Moore. Uh, Fahrenheit 911 had come out. It was playing all over Ottawa. And a guy in the States had made a film called Michael Moore Hates America. And I wanted to see it. And I sent an email to the Bytown. And I said, why don't you bring this film in? And uh, they sent me an email back. And they said, well, you know, it's not quite right for the way we license things. It's not, you know, a lot of excuses. And I realized the only way I could see a film like that was to actually uh, bring it in. And uh, we started, the first film we brought in two years ago was Obsession, a film of radical Islam. I hired the St. Laurent Shopping Center for the theater there, the Rainbow Theater, and uh, started promoting it. And uh, I was sitting at home one afternoon, I got this phone call from the manager, and she said, have you gotten this film past the Ontario Licensing Board? <laughs> And uh, I said, do I have to? She said, all film have to. You have to do it. You have to do it. So I called up the Ontario Film Licensing Board, and they said, no, no, it's a documentary. Documentaries are fine. You don't need a license for that. Um, and then uh, about half an hour later, I got an email from her, um, uh, we're canceling your film. And uh, we got an email from a retired professor at Carleton who thinks the movie maligns Muslims, and we're canceling it. And you can come see us and get your money back. And I thought this was a big media story, and uh, I did get some coverage in the sun, but not elsewhere. But uh, that was the start of the Free Thinking Film Society, and since then we've had films on uh, left-wing indoctrination universities, the power of unions in Quebec, uh, a look at the, the black community in the United States, we looked at uh, the media and the Obama campaign, and tonight is our first uh, speaker. Uh, and we're gonna have a lot of speakers in the future. Before I start to get into some of this, I really want to, a lot of people to thank. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Bruce for coming up to, to do this. I want to thank uh, Martin Lebuy, Terry Glavin, uh, David, uh, David Harris. I want to thank James and Mike and Tony, uh, Andrew, Vicky. A lot of people did a lot of work to, to help make this happen. Our next film is, and I think I'm going to find out tomorrow, but I think it's going to be October 18th. Uh, I'm hoping we'll be part of a world premiere of a, a new film uh, that's going to be showing in Washington and a whole variety of other cities um, on global warming. And hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be part of that world premiere, but I'll know tomorrow. Um, and mark your calendar, in November 2010, we'll be having our first annual uh, Free Thinking Film Festival. We'll have a whole weekend, we'll be right here, and we'll have around seven or eight films, panel, party, and stuff. And we'll uh, we'll show some of the great films we've shown in the past and a few new ones. I want to say a few words about tonight's um, uh, discussion and speech. I, I organized this, uh, I guess last May, May, June, uh, to bring Bruce to Canada. I was very excited about it because I had read his first book on the topic, While You're Upslept, and I was happy that I had three or three and a half months to do the publicity meant that I had a lot of time to contact uh, the media, the newspapers, radio, television, and give them a lot of time to really think about this topic and organize things. And uh, I got uh, the publisher to give me eight uh, free copies of the book to give out, besides the ones that I bought on my own dime. And I went out, and my first target was, of course, the, the CBC. So I contacted the... Uh, the Morning Show, which is, and I've been on The Morning Show. They actually had me on as a guest to promote uh, Indoctrinate You, and then our film, What Black Men Think, they'd actually given us some free promo slots for the film. So I was hopeful that with somebody as important as Bruce that we would get some coverage. And uh, the first person, the first producer I went to uh, was away on maternity leave. And I went to another producer, and the, the voicemail says, contact this other producer, and she was away on maternity leave, and I finally got a Another producer who actually got on the phone and uh, thought about it and uh, took a couple of weeks before they, they said, no, nah, no, nah, it's not right for us because we're only about Ottawa. And I said, well, Bruce is coming to Ottawa. It's a big event. He's coming. No, no, that's not the kind of thing we do. I said, but I've been on your show for, for, for movies. No, no, it's not right for the morning show. 
At the same time, I went to the afternoon show, Adrian Harewood. And I actually got a producer who was interested. And uh, they said, get us a book. So I ran down to CBC, got them a book, and uh, waited, waited and waited and waited. And I finally decided to call them. I called them, and they said, well, we haven't made a decision yet. Just give us some more time. It's still early. You know, it's still the summer. So I waited a week or two, called them back. No, no, we haven't made a decision yet. Uh, waited a couple days, called them back, and I'm still waiting for them to call me back. <laughs> they wouldn't even give me a call back about, about Bruce. Uh, I did get an email from somebody at CBC who used to work on The Current. He had since moved on to another show. He said, this is really interesting. I think this topic's important, in an email to me. He said, I passed this on to two producers of The Current, and I personally went myself to the people of The Current, and again, I'm still waiting for The Current uh, to get back to us. Uh, this really isn't that important for, for, for the CBC, obviously. We've got nothing from them. Uh, I went to uh, Express. You may know that lovely weekly newspaper we get here in Ottawa that covers weekly events. They've covered every one of my films, and they hate them all. Every time I show a film, I can count on a really bad review in Express, and I wear that really proudly. I like that, in fact, they hate it, because if they liked it, I'm probably doing something wrong. So I, I, I emailed the, uh, the editor, Cormac Ray, who I know, I've been to his office many times. Uh, he got back and said, yes, I'm very interested in covering this. And I emailed him back, I said, look, you know, don't make this a right-left issue. This is not like right or left. This is for, for all of us to be concerned about what's happening and uh, got him a copy of the book and uh, expressed decided not to not even pan Bruce, just to ignore Bruce, so nothing was an express. I then, at the same time, I went to the, the, the gay media, and I, I went to Capital Extra. I, I know Marcus McCann, the editor, very well. I've met him several times in various functions. Went to his office in June and said, I'm bringing in Bruce Bauer. He's a very important author. He's written some very important books about homosexuality, and. Uh, would you help me to organize a breakfast? I want to bring some of the top gay leaders in the city to have a breakfast with Bruce. Absolutely, I'll help you, for sure. Uh, got him a copy of the book uh, within days, and then I never heard anything from Marcus. And then every time I called him, he would not return my phone calls, and finally I got him on the phone. He said, well, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to be out of town. When, uh, when Bruce is here, I can't make that breakfast. And uh, I said, well, how about somebody else from Capital Extra, the newspaper? Well, there's nobody here who could really go to that breakfast. I said, well, who else should I be inviting in, in Ottawa who might want to meet Bruce? Well, uh, I don't know anybody. I said, well, you're the editor of the newspaper. You're at every event. And, uh, I just don't know anybody. I said, what about EGAL, the human rights group here in town? Would they be interested? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't even know. I don't know anybody at EGAL. I said, you don't know anybody in a gal, the human rights group? Uh, well, I do know a couple of people who tried these two names. <coughs> so I took down the names and, of course, went to the gal website, got their phone number, called them up, uh, get a voicemail. So I leave, leave a message for the two guys. Um, so at the same time, I send them an email. Nothing. Wait two weeks, do the same thing, get another voicemail. Um, more email, nothing. Um, and to their credit, I finally, after like a month and a half, I got an email back, actually a very nice email back from somebody in Toronto who was actually in the middle of reading your book, which was quite nice. Um, so that was at least something. But, um, uh, and then I went to uh, ask Alex Munter. I thought it would be very important for Alex Munter to come to a breakfast and meet uh, Bruce. And uh, needless to say, uh, that didn't work out either. Alex could not make tonight. He could not make a lunch. He couldn't make a breakfast. Um, he's got a very, very busy schedule. So um, it's been a little disappointing to have somebody like Bruce come to the city and really work hard and get you know, very, very, very little uh, media response. It's, it's a bit frustrating. Oh well, that's life. Anyways, we've got a great evening for you. A lot of people came out. I really appreciate it. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be interesting. Let me give you the agenda for tonight. Here's how it's going to work. Um, we're, 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 we're basically going to introduce a, a speaker and we're going to lead to Bruce. We're going to have a break with some food, drink. Bruce will be happy to sign some books. And then after the break, we're going to come back and have a panel discussion where the audience can ask questions of our panel. I'll introduce the panel at that time and, uh, and Bruce will be here to answer your questions as well. Thank you, Mark.
Uh, thank you, Fred. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And from now on, I think I will insist that everybody call me Dr. Bauer. Um, uh, I'm about to uh, tell you uh, pretty much what Mark just told you, only at much greater length. I'm here to talk uh, about a subject that a few years ago was not even on my radar. And I, I certainly never imagined that I would write a couple of books about. When I moved from New York to Europe in 1998, my plan was actually to write a book celebrating Amsterdam and the Netherlands. I had first visited the country a year earlier and had returned several times since. I was, I was enchanted by it, and I really had the impression that the Dutch had come closer than anyone else to attaining the complete secular liberal democracy that my own country's founding fathers had envisioned. I had never seriously thought of moving abroad, but I did. And within a few weeks of that move, I discovered that there was trouble in paradise. That indeed there was trouble throughout most of Western Europe. For when you strayed just slightly off of the tourist path, you found yourself in a different world. Now I'm from New York City, so I know what a North American immigrant neighborhood looks like. My father grew up in one. Immigration made North America what it is. Out of the immigrant neighborhoods of New York came the men and women who created Hollywood, who wrote the great American songbook, and who made extraordinary contributions to modern science, technology, and much else. That's not what I'm talking about here. Now, what I saw in Amsterdam, and would later see in one European city after another, were not temporary immigrant neighborhoods from which young people would move on to become well-integrated members of mainstream society, and some of whom would make extraordinary contributions to tomorrow's Europe. What I saw were steadily growing enclaves in which Muslim families had lived for two or three generations, where living on the dole had become a family tradition, where young people born in Europe to parents who had been born in Europe could barely speak the language of the country they had been born in, and where everybody, to a remarkable extent, was subject to 7th century Islamic law. Paradoxically, people who had come to Europe as refugees vacationed frequently in the countries they had supposedly fled. Many of them even maintained homes in their countries of origin, they had come to Europe as peasants, but now, thanks to the generosity of European welfare states and the radically different costs of living between Europe and the Muslim world, they were rich back in their home villages, employing servants and, in some cases, even owning slaves that had been purchased with European taxpayers' money. In these communities, you could find families who were collecting every possible form of welfare largesse available in their adopted country, including child support for children who did not exist and disability benefits for people who were as healthy as a horse. You could find men who had one wife in Europe and two or three more back in the old country. And you could find parents whose children were nowhere to be found because even though they were citizens of a European country, they were in fact attending madrasas thousands of miles away where they learned about nothing but the Quran and Sharia law certainly nothing about individual liberty, sexual equality, secular government, or critical thinking, except perhaps that all these things were utterly contrary to the will of Allah. 